What's going on, Little Rock? Awesome. I have to say hello to uh, some old friends that, uh, well, you guys kind of watch me meet them. Um, obviously, your own and the people that are very dear to me whose home I've been to, the lovely Osborne family. Hello, guys. <laughs> After I met Jennings and his family, I actually tweeted that, that I wanted to be Jennings Osborne when I grew up. And people were like, you must really like fireworks. And I said, <laughs> I go, have the dude's beef ribs, and you'll understand. And also, I don't know where the, the Merritt family is. Where are you guys from Cabot? What's going on, Buddy Merritt from the Mean Pig? And from the United States Air Force. Holla, holla, holla. Terrific. Ooh, this must be my clicker. That means there are slides. So it's audio-visual. There's pictures, so the guys will like it, too. Oh, come on, like we're not the reason that there are pictures in like books, are you kidding me? I had this like first aid book when I was a kid and like for the longest time I was like, why are you biting on a spider bite? It's like, no, you're sucking the poison out. I was like, oh, I just looked at the pictures, I didn't know. I was like, if I bite you, you'll forget about the spider bite. Anyway, so obviously um, it's amazing to be back here. I was uh, last year obviously to shoot uh, the episode of Man Vs. Food that we shot um, at Buddy's Place, The Mean Pig, at uh, Cottom's Mercantile, as you know, and, um, and at, obviously at the Osborne Family uh, Barbecue, which was redonkulously amazing as well. And uh, today I got a chance to tour the, uh, the Presidential Library, which was staggeringly awesome. And uh, yeah, you guys, seriously, I'll applaud that too. You know, and it's, it's crazy, because, um, 1992 was the first election I was allowed to vote in. Um, not like I had done something wrong, I was 18. It wasn't like I was extradited because of my dealings with the Corleone family and I couldn't vote. You know, leave the gun, take the Cottom's cheeseburger. Um, uh, people who know The Godfather explain the inside joke with that line, it's normally cannoli and, all right, moving on. So um, I was, um, big, big advocate. I was in the Young Dems at, at Emory University in Atlanta where I went to school and uh, uh, campaigned really heavily actually for President Clinton. And so to, to see all this stuff from the campaign and made manifest was pretty amazing. But I think we all know, you know why we're here, obviously. Um, I have this book that I've written, but tonight I think, especially because we are at the Clinton School and at the at near, you know, in his town, I, I, there's a quote, and I actually, I didn't want to misquote it, and I took a picture of it with my phone today. I'm not at all joking around, and I did not want to misquote, because I felt it was so relevant to the subject matter at hand. Sorry, that was a very compromising picture of me, no, I'm just kidding. Um, oh, stop. I'm on my Brett Favre. All right. I don't even own a pair of Crocs. Anyway. It's funny, because it's topical. He said, we must put a human face on the global economy. An international market that fails to work for ordinary citizens will neither earn nor deserve their confidence and support. And I think that here we are where essentially the next wave of diplomats and public servants are, are being minted and we're in a world that is progressively shrinking. You know, I talked about this this afternoon that with applications like Facebook and Twitter, you know, people can know where you are in real time. You can write something here in Little Rock and someone in, in England, in Salisbury, England, can read it in real time. And it's a pretty amazing thing. And so here you are in this, in this shrinking world and it has become less of a choice and more of a necessity to kind of become like a global citizen. No, no, it's kind of odd to talk about global citizenry. I hope I didn't, that was a volume thing. There's no, no sound in my slides, it's pretty boring. Um, but it's kind of odd considering I do. Where is it? Are they showing? They're showing here. I wish you could see it. <laughs> I think, uh, can we, I don't care about like breaking the fourth wall. Is there a way to make this work? Yeah. Hey, that's not me. <laughs> I, I haven't read that book. I'm not even that wimpy a kid. Hey. So I, I, I call this picture the, uh, the passion of the rich. 
But um, that's from the LA Challenge. Now, obviously, this is kind of what I've done, but there is a language that we all speak. Now, you guys know where I'm from. I talk about it all the time. So on the count of three, in your best hip hop voice, will you please for me, one, two, three. Where am I from? <laughs> Holla, that's right, no sleep till. Now obviously, growing up in Brooklyn, I become inundated with a lot of first generation ethnic cooking. You know, it's uh, obviously cheaper to live than most places in New York. A third of the United States can trace their roots back to Brooklyn. And there's a lot of communities of undiluted ethnic concentration, which if you don't want to be like all like PC and like mm, about it, just mean like first generation off the boat, undiluted, real ethnic communities. True, true, true Vietnamese, you know, Fukien, province China, Gujarat, India, like very specific, specific communities who will take with them these foods, you know, in their hearts and under their babushkas across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, that they will bring these things and they will want to feed them to their friends who are also in search of their homeland. Now, this is my experience, but you have to understand there's a language we all speak. Buddy, look familiar? That's right. So this is from right here in Cabot. And again, you see these reactions? And when I hear them, I hear a little, mm. Oh, that's all right. That's a good thing. That's because this, these pickles in Philadelphia, or that's right. That's okay. Don't be afraid of it. It's a triple pork explosion. Y'all like Razorbacks. So, <laughs> so you have the triple pork. Speaking of which, Jennings, your smoker with the smoke comes out of its butt is the coolest thing in the world, by the way. <laughs> so awesome. Anyway, so Voodoo Donut in Portland, Oregon. By the way, random side note, these things... Hello. These things right here, uh, the two things that are crossed, are called maple blazer blunts. And when any of the Portland Trailblazers is arrested on marijuana charges, they go on sale for a dollar. <laughs> they go on sale a lot. <laughs> yes, they, they may be moving to Amsterdam. Who knows? Anyway, so, so there's this. There's some uh, pulled pork from Slows. Ah. That's right, that is right. You see, people thought it was just in Kathy cartoons. That's the third time today I've referenced Kathy, but it's the truth. And homemade chocolates in St. Louis. Now why, why do we have these visceral reactions? It's because this is this one thing we all do. We all key in on it. We all have our own food culture, our own food language that we speak. Now, if you think about these you know, immigrant communities that have come to the United States, no, I'm not related to any of these people. Not at all. Although, doesn't that guy at the end right there look like when they made that dude grow his beard and knocked up? <laughs> right? A little bit? He wants to rear your children. Um, it's funnier if you've seen it. And, uh, but you have to understand that these people are looking for a taste of their homeland that they can afford. More often than not, because there was linguistic halting that they would create these enclaves that you can experiment with in New York, just a matter of block difference. And you can really, really throw yourself into the exploration. Now, let's talk a little bit about me. So I grew up in Brooklyn. I know, all downhill from there. And uh, I mean, I was technically born in Manhattan, moved to Brooklyn because my mom's boobs were there, so I followed the milk and I, um, it's a fact of life, a fact of life. Anyway, so Brooklyn has these amazing pockets of concentration. These neighborhoods are divided along sometimes religious lines, ethnic lines, but it's not like the borderland. It's not, you know, across this line, you know, is, is trouble. It's about, this is where we have settled. The immigrants that are traveling that are not cooks and not chefs are going for tastes of the homeland that they left. And honestly, these are the people that are usually supporting the service industries throughout the five boroughs of New York, and as such, the price point has to be significantly lower. So there are communities like the heavily West Indian Flatbush neighborhood, not too far from where I am. You saw the Mauritanian flag, Trinidad, great jerk chicken and pigeon peas, the obviously significantly Chinese community in Sunset Park, which is amazing and amazing, amazing food. The heavily Jewish uh, Borough Park in Crown Heights. 
And then not too far from where I live, the very heavily Middle Eastern Arabic influence Atlantic Avenues. Um, then there's the deeply Polish Greenpoint neighborhood where uh, my great grandma hails from. And you, she used to say the brown bread, the kapusta, the kolbasi, all the things she would buy there were as good if not better than in the old country. And it was, she was able to get them year round and get them in a safe environment. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, incredible Polish baked goods. This particular slide I love because there's Staropolsky and Starabucksky. I'll have a Vinsky, a Vinsky Frappuccinski, and then McDonald's for good measure. Then there's Bensonhurst, very heavily Italian neighborhood. That's 86th Street by the L, the elevated subway tracks. That's the street where uh, John Travolta had his two slices of pizza and the opening of Saturday Night Fever. And he's Amazing fresh mozzarella and the Homecrest neighborhood where I grew up, which has now, not when I was growing up, has become another Chinatown where apparently they enjoy washing feet. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. You know what they say, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> I just enjoy washing feet, I do. Love to see the CV that comes with that, you know, must, must enjoy <laughs> washing feet. Now, if you grow up in Brooklyn, as I did, you end up kind of becoming a citizen of the world in many respects just by virtue of the fact that you're around these families. I mean, the first marinara I had was not out of a jar. It was at Nicky Agostino's house across the street from my own with his grandmother, who spoke virtually no English. She spoke very, very effective slap. That is to say, if you got in the furniture, she... <laughs> and she to get you just right, right there, this nice thud. You're like, okay, I'm not doing that again. But she would crush the garlic into the the marble with a calcified thumb, you know, and it was, these were the recipes that she wasn't following. These recipes were in her heart. They were part of her DNA. And then as such, when Nicole's sister now makes them for her children, I mean, excuse me, when Nikki's sister, Nicole, now makes them for her children, she's also now using her sensibilities, using organic tomatoes and using heirloom garlic, and, but it's still grandma's recipe, but now it's coming through her filter. And so when you grow up in Brooklyn, whether your friends are from Guyana or Russia or Haiti, or Greece, or the Ivory Coast, they're still your friends, but you're going to assimilate all these different things. So my mother, who teaches, teaches in Bensonhurst, and she used to teach in Sheepshead. So from the Sheepshead people, she would pick up, you know, Russian, Ukrainian recipes and integrate them into her own. She would pick up Italian recipes and integrate them into her own, and suddenly you're using a different cut of meat in meatloaf. You're using a different type of something on a salad. You're mixing eggs with potatoes and green peppers. And the simple fact is these are all recognizable things, but the combinations are unique. And look at my sweet hair. It looks like a, like a furry jellyfish just <laughs> mating with my scalp. Back in the day, that was happening, though. That was, that was fun for me. So obviously I grew up, played football, played lacrosse, started acting a bit. But in my family, food was always, always, you know, a key component of love, of language, of sharing. That's my mom. You may recognize her from uh, the Brooklyn episode and the New York episode of the show. It was a couple of Thanksgivings ago. And the thing is, I realized something. That food, you know, there's an expression that was once used on NPR that they say, you know, when a chef makes a dish, they really put their foot in it. Now, not a literal expression, because that's gross. That's just disgusting. Like, you put your foot in these collard greens. It's not a compliment if you've actually put your feet in the collard greens. But it not only, what the um, commentator on NPR said, it's not just that you have acquitted yourself well in the making of the dish. It is that you have left your thumbprint you have left your experience, your history, all the history of your life, of your eating life, has come into that kitchen and is now manifest in this dish. And I realized then that if that's the case, then all food's part of a larger continuum. Where it came from, where it's going to, and everything that brought me to that dish is now part of that story. I began to look a little bit more into food, and I started cooking professionally, right? That's kind of studly right? Not too bad. Making disgusting things like this macrobiotic sushi, as you can see here. But I also realized that food, while you can have an academic study of it and you can enjoy it, can be fun. That's me catering the Peloponnesian War. 
I used to joke, I'd be like, Spartans, tonight we dine on pepper steak and enchiladas in hell. <laughs> Speaking of which, I don't know, this is a random factoid that you may or may not want to know, but a lot of these battle reenactments, some of these bearded, like, tough soldiers are women. And I was, like, serving some, pe I was, like, serving pepper steak. And I was like, oh, do you want some rice? And I hear, yeah. And I was like, oh, I looked up. And it wasn't a dude with a high voice. It was a woman. And uh, she had this beard, you know, just glued to her face with spirit gum. And it's very confusing because I was like, you're so, so hot, yet so very bearded. And it was... <laughs> Very hard for me to juxtapose, so I strapped on a helmet and bravely went about my duties. I'll just let this joke land. <laughs> if you're flexible enough. And, uh... Young people explain it to the old people, but not before they buy my book. <laughs> it's naughty! Now, that's a bagel, and we'll talk about that in a moment. See, what I ultimately realized was this. Food, in any of its manifestations, right, is slavery, agriculture, trade routes, history, climate changes, geography, topography, made manifest in bite-sized morsels. So let's talk a little bit about the bagel. Show of hands, who's eaten one? Okay, excellent, see? Carbs are not the enemy. They are the unity. I love it. It's the circle of bagel that unites us. Right? I want to hear Disney make a song about that. It's the circle of carbs. You can, like, hold the bagel up like, like the little baby. The onion king. Anyway. So, the Bialy king. So, the bagel. We've all had it. We all know what it is. It's a high-gluten, high-yeast roll, boiled, then baked, and often, more often than not, made into a circle. Now, let's talk about the history of it. Initially, it was conceived as an alternative bread to a bread called bublik, which was kind of a crappy bread that they used to serve for Lent. Really not too cool. Now, the great thing about bagels, uh, the structure of them, just chemically, is quite simply this, that you can just... If they get stale, you soak them in water, and they've kind of come back to square one, right? So you could have a few of them on hand, and should they go stale, you didn't have to throw it out. They had uses. So for me, growing up in Brooklyn, obviously knowing bagels, I never really thought too much about them. It's a bagel. It goes with lox and a schmear in the New York Times. You know, I'm a typical New York Jew. New York Times, good. Bagel, good. Joe Franklin, okay. And, like, you know, like, you know these things. Anyway, I had seen a culinary anthropologist on television, and I didn't even realize that, you, that such a field existed, that you could look at a people, at a society, a civilization, and analyze it using food as the point of departure, that you could actually use food as a way in to understand them as opposed to excavating the urns with which they would keep ritual cat feces or something like this. Do you know what I mean? It's a freaky society, I'm sure. But I mean, the thing is that you can break it apart. So let's break apart the bagel, if you will. So this bagel initially was conceived because of a prince named Jan Sobieski, no relation to Lili of acting fame. Whatever happened to her after Deep Impact? I miss that long face of hers. Anyway, <laughs> why the long face? So. Jan Sobieski was a Polish prince who actually rescued the Jews of Poland, of Austria, and of Turkey from the Ottoman Turks. Well, a baker who had originally come from Vienna, who now lived in Poland, decided to bake these things in the shape of a circle because of Prince Sobieski's um, infatuation with equestrian sports. So he called it Beugel, B-E-U-G-E-L. Beugel, use it in a sentence. No, I'm just kidding. So the Beugel means stirrup in Yiddish. That's where the name came from. So it was all the rage. I guess it was the, uh, the silly bands of its time. You know, the edible silly, yeah, I wear them, what? <laughs> anyway, and no, I'm not trading, <laughs> anyway. So they caught fire, and they were all over, and they were interesting, and they were new, and they were cost effective, and they could come in different flavors. And what happened was Russian merchants used to make them smaller and call them bubliki. 
because they reminded them of the bublik. They had no frame of reference for the Yiddish. So they were called bubliki, and then they would hear boigel, and it kind of became bagel, this thing that they didn't really know what it was. And they would put a bunch of them on strings, string it to their belt, and literally sell them by pulling them off all across the, the frozen steppes of Russia and the Balkans. And they began to move e further east, further east, further east, until the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, big, big, big immigration movement, as we all know from the awesome black and white picture I showed a couple slides back. And in so doing, they brought with them this tradition. Now, a tremendous amount of immigrants moved from the Lower East Side by virtue of the fact that it was so crowded. That's why there's the Galveston movement that happened in 1916, 1927, where they were trying to push immigrants to Galveston, Texas. And a bunch went to Canada. And actually in Montreal, in Montreal, you know, land of moose and hockey and Labatt Blue and people that go, bombs ready, buddy. Yeah, I watch South Park too. I do. The Canadian government has apologized for Brian Adams on several occasions. <laughs> anyway, the bagel, eh? So Montreal actually became the very first spot of the bagel baking union. Not a culture, not a place you would associate with Jews, with bagels, with anything of the sort. So a couple of enterprising Jews said, all right, you know what, we're, we're done. We're done with Canada. We want to go where there's a Russian and Polish market that will buy this, that recognize this. So they moved to Connecticut, right outside of New Haven. Their last names, Lender and Sender. Now these two guys built the absolute first, biggest bagel baking, mass producing machine in a garage. Yeah, what are you doing in your garage? You know what I mean? It's like, I have like a punching bag, that's about it. No bagel baking machine. And so these guys made this machine, but again, bagels go incredibly stale because of the pockets of air that all that yeast actually holds in them. Well, Maury Lender goes off to the Korean War. And when he's off in the Korean War, in Korean culture, there's a big emphasis on pickled, potted, and preserved foods. Not just kimchi, which is fermented and kept in the ground, but all the panchan, things that are salted, things that are encased in clay and jars. But also, there, was a, there were tremendous strides made forward in Korean cuisine with cellophane wrapping and packaging foods. And to keep them for infinite, infinitely longer than they ever could in America. So Murray Lender actually began to investigate this technology while he was in Korea. He takes this Korean technology back to Connecticut, says, let's mass market the bagels. We'll make them smaller like they were in Russia as opposed to the bigger sort of New York style bagels that we may or may not be used to. We'll do them, we'll pack a dozen, we'll use this new technology and send them. And it's actually because of Murray Lender that we're sitting here in Little Rock, Arkansas and everyone's had bagels. Now understand now that this little bit of baked and boiled dough took a journey from Vienna to Poland to Russia to Canada to Connecticut to Korea to Connecticut to New York to Little Rock and on and on and on. Now this is all I'm saying. That bagel can just be a totally awesome breakfast. It could be a great hangover cure. It could be something good to soak up the gravy on whatever there you're eating there. It, it doesn't have to be anything more than just a delicious, chewy, crusty, badass bagel. It doesn't have to be. But you can also understand that it is also part of a larger continuum. That that bagel has a story and it doesn't end when it touches your plate or your lips. That story continues. So you can begin working in your own ingredients, your own flavors. So right now, just people, just shout out your favorite flavors of bagels. Onion, Onion everything, salt, what? Blueberry. Pumpernickel, sesame, plain, cinnamon, exactly. And there are these flavors. We've heard savory, we've heard onion, everything, garlic, salt. We've heard blueberry, we've heard cinnamon. And all of these things are now your preference and what you choose to put on them and how you choose to serve them. Toast them, don't toast them. This cheese, that cheese. This meat, that meat. This fish, that fish. No fish at all. The thing is, this becomes your expression. And all of that history from Korea, from Montreal, from Russia, from Poland, from the first boigle that was ever made and as an homage to an equestrian loving prince. The fact of the matter is that bagel is part of your story as well. You become part of that continuum. And this bagel, this bagel comes from Talkeetna, Alaska. This man has never been to New York, never met a Jew before me, and made this bagel. Now there's no hole in it. It's arguably one of the absolute best bagels I've ever eaten. That's why I took a picture of it. 
And this is a man who has no connection to Russia, to Poland, to Canada, to Connecticut, to Korea, or any of these places. And this is part of his story. And I now speak the same language that he does. We are now connected to every single one in this room, every single one who's eaten a bagel before us, and every single bagel manufacturer now. Because we all speak this beautiful language. There is this homogeneity in this community centered around nothing more complicated than a beautiful bit of baked and boiled dough. And that's all I want to mention to all of you tonight. In whatever capacity you can, understand that you can create manifestations of your own DNA, of your own self in dishes. You know, every culture has meatloaf. We all love mom's meatloaf. Who else mom puts the stripe of ketchup on the top? Come on. Everyone puts the stripe of ketchup on the meatloaf. But the thing is, there's this rollat, stefania sellet, foloren hare, there's kofta, there's embatido, there's all these different versions of meatloaf. So if you're of Greek descent, you can use lamb and pine nuts and feta and oregano and basil, and it's your thing. If you're, you know, you're from Texas, you want to use ground brisket, you want to use different spices and ancho chilies and make your thing, if you want to use pork, the thing is you can tell your story using your food because there is only one of you in time. You know, Martha Graham said to Agnes DeMille, it's not your job to judge whether it's good or bad. It's only your job to keep the channel open. So go out of your comfort zone, go to that weird neighborhood where they enjoy washing feet, where there's Starabuckski and Starapolsky side by side, where there's dragon festivals, where they sell mooncakes right next to a subway. Try these places out, because who knows, that one ingredient, that one preparation methodology may lead you down some amazing, amazing avenues. And from the bottom of my heart, I, I can't thank you all enough for just for your hospitality and your kindness to me since I've been here in Little Rock. You guys are the best. I don't want to talk too long because I want to make sure that I have time for questions. So before I get studious, they took the bar. <laughs> I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. I hope I get a chance to see you all at the signing. I'm spilling some coffee. I'm going to put that down. I'm going to say thank you all very, very much. <laughs> the computer's OK, more or less. No, it's all right. The computer's it's okay. It just stopped shy of the computer. It's my, it's my computer. Don't it's your computer? It's mine. Yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Can I download some stuff? No, it's cool. <laughs> Nothing freaky deaky. Hide your say, kids, hide your wife, hide your kids, hide your wife, and hide your husband. No? It is a state computer, so we can just find out who did it. So gotcha. Well, no, the thing is for me, you know... To know the strides that he made for funk music as we know it makes me so honored to be here at the George Clinton Library. And <laughs> I knew he was president. I, I, I knew he was president. I knew he was in Parliament. Right. But he's president and Parliament. That's, That's amazing. You know, well, there was less. There was like socks and stuff, nothing but Bootsy Collins. Very, very surprising. Socks, but no Bootsy. It's not a good way to go about in this cold weather. Fact. My name is. <laughs> Nikolai De Pippa, and I'm the director of uh, music at the George Clinton School. Bow, 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 slapping the bass big time. So we're going to take some questions. Um, it, I want to start with kind of a, a topic about the book, mostly how did you select the nine cities that you went through? I think basically I wanted to... Borrow, to borrow parlance from the Dave Chappelle show, I keeps it real. And I, um, I've actually lived, I've spent significant time in these cities and I didn't want to come off half cocked. I didn't want to, to kind of bloviate on about things that I only knew from books. So it was important to me, two things, to choose places I had been, places that I had a strong connection to, places where I felt um, there was a food story to tell. But furthermore, I think it was important to have a, a mix of cities like San Francisco or Brooklyn, New York, where there is a significant culinary identity and juxtapose that with places like St. Louis or Cleveland where maybe St. Louis is a little bit more known for barbecue, but generally speaking, it doesn't have a culinary identity that 
people necessarily can go to on immediate recall, and I wanted to highlight their culinary profiles as well. Okay. If you have uh, questions, kind of hard to see, but we've got two mics on, on this side um, right here. See? Hi there. Um, I actually don't have a question about food. I was wondering if you are by any chance dating anybody. <laughs> No. no, no, because I have brought your soulmate with me. Yes, I have. That's where she's been. Yes. Oh, you know, I looked under the couch. I looked everywhere. She's been at my house, and oh. so, yeah, that's why you couldn't find her. But oh. I brought her here tonight to meet you. So. It's taken you long enough. Thanks. I'm sorry. I had things to do today. <laughs> well, that's very benevolent of you. Thank you. Dr. Phil has nothing on you. No. We match you with five components of an audience member of your choice. <laughs> we will find you. This is welcome to Little Rock. This is E Hominy. <laughs> we'll see you up there. Count it. <laughs> I'll be here all week. Is this on? Sure, go ahead. Right here. Um, what was your favorite challenge? Alaska. Alaska. Uh, just a lot of variety and very fresh, very fresh stuff. On this side? Yeah, Adam, I've watched your show on TV and I have two questions. Yes, sir. Do you have a real good gastroenterologist? <laughs> I do. And, you know, the, the buffet story is you can eat all you can hold down instead of take what you eat and all that, but can you keep everything on your stomach that we see you eat in some of these shows when you oh. like eat an eight pound? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, um, in a million years, never did I think when I hit mid thirties that like people, and, and I'm not like trying to, to mock, I, I have strangers asking me bathroom questions. <laughs> and it's like, if I weren't doing what I was doing, like I, I really like, I had to say to a guy in Boulder, Colorado, I'm like, so just let's recap what just happened. You went up to a grown man who you don't know, who you've never met, and asked him about his poo. I generally don't discuss that with anyone but said good gastroenterologist, so I'm gonna keep that track record pretty much unbroken. <laughs> kind of like the bills and sucking. The Buffalo Bills keep that track record. What? Three and eight? They they three? I thought they got two and no, two, two and nine. Two, yeah. That's two and nine. Okay. Three. Exhibit A, Your Honor. <laughs> one. We have time for one more, and then we'll get to the book signing. I kind of had a question um, that related to somebody else, but what has been the hardest challenge you've ever attempted or um, completed? Uh, 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 Sarasota was pretty bad. It's the only spicy challenge I've ever lost. That was pretty, pretty painful pretty awful well thank you all for for coming out this evening we do have his book available in the in the lobby and uh it, it's, it's good it is it, and if you don't like it it can be used as a great coaster for two jumbo beverages <laughs> so thank you yeah level tables thank you